We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 55 this morning. I invite you to turn there. Uh, we have been looking at snapshots of God's character uh, as we have seen them throughout the book of Isaiah. Uh, week number one, we talked about how God is a holy God. And before we can look at that God is a God of mercy, and he is that, right? We have seen that this week. He is certainly a God of mercy. We need to recognize that before we even acknowledge his, how merciful he is, he is a holy God. And we are also challenged uh, in the book of Isaiah and 1 Peter that uh, even as he is holy, I am supposed to be what? Holy. I'm supposed to be holy. How do I do that? Do I ever get to that point here on earth where I am exactly like he is? Uh, here's the short answer. Uh, this I don't know. I, I am not going to get there, but we're going to see today that we're invited to keep on going. And we are supposed to keep on walking with him. We serve a holy God. We look at the fact that God is awesome, right? And, and that word kind of gets a bad rap. Now, Judy did some of the cooking out there at camp this week. Was the food good? Okay, so I understand the biscuits and gravy were great this morning. Okay, okay, so now they're saying everything. So, uh, Judy, mark this week down for next year. Um, the, the, the kids are going like this. I'm just getting that look from Judy, right? Um, you know what? The food was fantastic, wasn't it? The food was fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you know what? As great as the food was... I would, I, would, I would caution you, uh, the food is good, God is awesome, okay? And, and God shows himself uh, in creation and in how he provides for us, he is an awesome God. Last week we looked at the fact that God is sovereign. There's nothing that takes God by surprise, right? And, and even in the depths of our despair, when we don't know which way to turn, uh, God is there. Isn't it great to know that God brings well-being to us? If you are here today, it is the grace of God that you are here today. Praise God for that. You know, God brings well-being. You know what? God also allows tragedy to strike. And none of us here in, in this place this morning are immune from that. Okay? Why is it that we go through all of these trying times? Why is it? Then we go through illness, maybe uh, perhaps the death of a loved one, uh, job situations that we just don't understand. Why is it that we go through all of those things? You know what? God does allow those things, doesn't he? Here, here's the short answer that we looked at last week. The short answer is this. We go through these things ultimately so that God can get the glory. That's why we go through those things. Do we feel like giving God glory when we get news like that? You know what? I will confess to you, my first reaction isn't to do that. But yet, what is my first reaction supposed to be? <laughs> to do exactly that, okay? Uh, so we serve a holy God, a God who is awesome, a God who is sovereign. And when we look at those three things, to me, that's what makes this portion of Scripture so powerful. Because we are invited to experience the works of God. Isaiah chapter 55, uh, I want to read just verse 1. And I want to start here. It says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. There's a word that was repeated four times in that verse. What was the word? Come. come. We are invited to come. You know what? My heart agrees for, for those Christians that just kind of throw in the towel. My heart grieves for those who at one point were walking with God and they were walking so strongly, or so it seemed, Right? It's, it might seem that way to us. But then all of a sudden, instead of walking fast, when Miranda saw that snake, she was walking fast. Okay? You're walking fast, and then all of a sudden, you're just kind of ambling along. Okay? 
uh, pretty soon you're crawling, okay? And you're looking for something and, and it's not there. It's kind of like being in the desert, right? And you're looking for a place to go and to get refreshed. And pretty soon you're crawling and you're just going and, and pretty soon you can't even do that. And you collapse. You know what, sometimes in the Christian walk we see that, don't we? We see it with, with uh, uh, leaders in the church. We see it with, with you and me sometimes. We have found ourselves in that desert place where the walk seems very burdensome. You know, we allow the crises of life to kind of get in our way sometimes. And, and instead of praising God, we allow them to be obstacles. What do we do with obstacles? There's several things. We either plow through them, and let's face it, some obstacles, that's a rather easy thing to do, right? So if you're at the finish line, okay, and I'm not a runner, I never profess to be, but I understand they have like this ribbon set up, right? Okay, is that ribbon much of an obstacle? No, what happens? You know, you're running for all your worth, and, and you, if you're the first one there, you break that line. Boy, that's a great obstacle to break, isn't it? Woohoo, you feel so good. Look what I did. And Chris is going, yeah, I know that feeling. And Scott's going, I don't know. Yeah, it, you know, it's, a, it's an obstacle. How about, how about if you run into a brick wall? Is that as easy to break through as, as a little piece of paper? Okay, so with a brick wall, you're either going over it, you're either going under it, you're going around it, the most painful thing, you're going through it, okay? That's what an obstacle is. It, it's something that gets in your way. And our crises of life sometimes are like that. And you know, it's, it's never just that one crisis that, that puts us in that spot, is it? It's, it's kind of like when you have car trouble, you know? Uh, did you know that, that the engineers in their infinite wisdom, they created this special indicator to tell us when something's wrong with our vehicle. It's called a check engine light. Have you ever seen that? Okay, if you've seen it, that's not a good thing. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying, okay? But when you see a check engine light come on, what should you do? <laughs> you should check the engine. Absolutely, why? because there's a problem there, okay? And so if, if all of a sudden your check engine light comes on and you think to yourself, ooh, I might have a problem, and then two months later you, you look at that and you say, oh, that pesky light is still on, and then the very next day you're driving down 94 doing 70 miles an hour and all of a sudden your car dies? You know what, the problem wasn't that the car died at that exact time. Newsflash, you should have checked the light two months ago and you may have been able to take care of the problem. See, sometimes that's what life is. Things happen, but we, we don't go into maintenance, maintenance mode uh, to figure things out. Our walk with God is so vitally important that we are, that we are walking true with him. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 tells us this. says, you know what? Uh, don't crawl across the finish line. Uh, when Paul writes Timothy, he tells him this. He says, you know what? Finish well. Finish well. How do we finish well? It is by walking with God, by having that relationship with God. And we are invited here to experience the work of God in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah describes the benefits of walking with God over the long haul like this. Permanent and complete satisfaction with the things of God. Isaiah talks about abundance that this world knows nothing about. Immeasurable forgiveness. Boy, that's something that we kind of struggle with sometimes, isn't it? Immeasurable forgiveness that transforms your heart and transfers it to others. And then we have truth that takes root in our lives and produces what I call a bumper crop of God's confidence year after year. I don't know about you all. Um, I need that. I want to experience that. I want to experience the permanent and complete satisfaction with the things of God. 
Why do we walk with God? We walk with God for these four reasons. Nowhere else in scripture do we read a chapter that is packed more fully with God's invitation to experience his work. And can I say this? It starts out with a bang in verse 1. We find abundant satisfaction. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. Come, he says. God wants to be for your soul what water is for your body. Have you ever just been just incredibly parched? You've been just so dehydrated and, and all you can think of is something to drink. Have you ever been there? If you've had kidney stones, you've really been there, okay? Okay, so when you find yourself thirsty, what's the best thing for you to have? Water, okay? And I'm saying this, and I'm a coffee guy. But when, when you are dehydrated, and when you find yourself in that place, every doctor or nurse will tell you, water is the best thing to have. When you are dehydrated, only water will do. And you know what? Water's all around us, isn't it? I mean, we kind of take that for granted. Water is everywhere. If I'm, if I'm in my office and, and I need a, a glass of water, I go to my fridge, I pull out a bottle of water, I'm good. Robert might be out doing the yard, it, it, fantastic. It, it's just looking wonderful this year. And there's been times where I've been here and uh, I'm going out to check on him. And I'll say, hey, I've got some water here and he'll hold up too and he'll say I'm covered, okay? Uh, when you're out doing that, uh, water is important and, and water is everywhere. But you know what? There is always going to be that one that is going to say, oh, I'm so thirsty. Oh, I'm just parched. I need a Mountain Dew. <laughs> or I, I need a cup of coffee. There's always going to be that one. Have you ever asked why everyone won't drink? I mean, we're told right here in Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. What a great invitation that is. But not everybody is going to drink. And there's a couple of objections here that we hear over and over again. The first one is this. You know what? Boy, that just sounds so good. I, I've been out here. I've been working hard. The water sounds so good. Uh, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. Isaiah says, come anyway. It says in verse 1. Nothing that God wants to give you is going to cost you a dime. He freely gives. If you're thirsty, come to me. What does it say here in the next part of the verse? It says, hey, no money, no problem. You come. You let me provide for you. Everything that God gives to you is absolutely free. How do I know that? Because when I came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, you know what? I didn't have to pay an entry fee. It was free. Everything that God gives you is free. It sounds good, but I can't afford it. Uh, here's what Isaiah says. Newsflash, no worries. I'm providing this for you. Objection number two. Water is great, but I need more than water. I need more than that. How many of y'all have ever said that? You know, I, I'm really thirsty, and, and I know water's good, but uh, I, just, I just drink this stuff from the French Alps somewhere that's bottled every other Thursday. Uh, you know, uh, we, we either get real picky, or we say, you know what, I need, I need more than that. Have you ever said in your heart that God is not enough to satisfy you? Have you ever come to that place? Here's what Isaiah says. Isaiah says, he who has no money, come, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk with money, or without money and without price. Here's what Isaiah is saying here. God is going to provide for you. And every objection that you can put into how God provides for us, you know what, there's an answer in God's word. Isaiah says simply, come, come. 
It talks of eating. It talks of God's provision, a, a banquet feast that, that very well could be prepared. When God says he's going to take care of you, he doesn't just do the minimum requirements. He gives you everything that you need. Now, think about this for a minute. And we've, we talked about this last week a little bit. What I think I need might be very different from what God knows I need. Okay? But God takes care of us. He invites us to come. We need to be able to find our satisfaction in the provision of God and experiencing his works and how he provides for us. Uh, there's a lesson in satisfaction that we can learn uh, from music. There was, there's an artist out there, uh, Mick Jagger, who sings a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, right? Okay, so a lot of people know that song. Uh, it's been said that when, when he started singing that song, he, he said, you know what, by the time I'm 45, I don't ever want to sing that song again. Guess what? How old is he now? He's got to be 145 now. Uh, he's still singing that song. Isn't it sad that the message of that song is, I can't get any satisfaction? He's tried it all. Does that sound familiar? We look into the book of Ecclesiastes and we have that same theme, don't we? We've tried it all. And our satisfaction doesn't come from the things of the world around us. Our satisfaction comes from God. And that is where we are to find our satisfaction and our delight is in a fulfilling relationship with God. It's a relationship that will last forever. Isaiah 55, 3, incline your ear. In other words, Isaiah is saying, hey, listen to this. Come hear me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. It's an everlasting covenant. We've talked about this before. Our God is not a contract God. He is a covenant God. And Isaiah is saying this is a relationship that will last forever. What does that relationship look like? It says here, look at David. Was David perfect? No. No. Was David like you and me? <laughs> sure was. Okay. Did David find a great delight in God? Sure he did. Okay. Was David a leader of people? He sure was. Did David sin? He sure did. Did God watch out for David? Yes, yes he did. What does that relationship look like? It looks just like that. You know what? When times are great, God is there. And when I'm not doing my part, and when all of a sudden I find myself crawling, you know what? God doesn't kick me to the curb and say, next. He is a covenant God. He is right there. He is there to help me. He is there to lift me up. He is there to encourage me. He promises to measure his kindness according to the mercies shown to David. Was David shown mercy after mercy and grace after grace? Yeah, guess what? You are too. It's a relationship that lasts forever. It says it's an everlasting covenant. Isaiah 55, 5 says this, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. God's provision is for those that come to him. Aren't you thankful? If you are a child of God, he provides every good thing for you. Absolutely. We need to be thankful for that. Salvation is for everyone. And God's provision and grace is for everyone. But Isaiah 55 verse 6 tells us we need to do our part in this. It says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found to call on him while he is near. Seek the Lord. Call on him. 
You know what? Decision time is today, isn't it? Okay. Um, is there ever a bad time to make a decision for Jesus Christ? No. There's, there is no such thing as a bad time. We can come to him. I'm going to say it this way. Let your hour of conviction be your hour of decision. You have a great need. You go to God. And you pray. God is laying something on your heart. Let that moment be the moment that you go to him. Let it be exactly that. How do we let our hour of conviction be our hour of decision? Isaiah 55, 7 gives us, gives us two words that we want to look at. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. We see that word forsake. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. So we're leaving something, and when we're leaving that, we are doing what? We are returning to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, <laughs> and there will be abundant pardon. You see, when it comes to our walk with God, aren't you thankful that we have forgiveness of sin? And Isaiah is saying, this is, this is going to be huge. We have a new look at forgiveness. That he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Uh, verse 8, for my thoughts, and we all know this one, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Praise God for that. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We talked last week about how God is sovereign and God is in control of it all. And you know what? God doesn't have to consult me for what he does. And, and God doesn't have to explain every little thing that he does in my life. How come? <laughs> it blow me away, first of all. God doesn't have to explain himself to me. Why? He's so much bigger than I am. He is so much bigger than I am. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. And that is what forgiveness is all about. How we look at forgiveness, we think about who we should forgive. We think about how many times we should forgive, how often we should forgive. We're going through a difficult situation at work, and, and boy, you know what, that person... They're just getting under my skin. And I don't know what to do. And so I do this, and I do this, and I pull my hair out, and I, uh, I do all of these things. And so we, we talk about forgiveness, and we say, you know, this person's easy to forgive. This one, mm, I don't know. They've gotten under my skin one too many times. I think we've all been there uh, at one point or another. So that's how we look at forgiveness. We kind of put conditions on things, don't we? How does God look at forgiveness? God looks at forgiveness this way. He says, abundant pardon and abundant grace. Let's turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 103. I'm going to read verses uh, 2 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He does all of these things. That is how God looks at forgiveness. And can I say, the way he looks at forgiveness uh, calculates a whole lot differently than how I look at forgiveness. Isaiah is saying, here is a new look at what forgiveness 
looks like. Oh, that we would be very quick to be on the giving end of forgiveness. Oh, that we would be very quick to forgive those who we perceive have wronged us in some way, who have perceived wrongs done. May we offer forgiveness where we have been wrong and where we fall short. And I, I'm also going to say it this way. I'm going to turn that around a little bit, okay? May we be very quick to accept the forgiveness of others when they come and apologize. We talked, uh, it's been quite a while back, we talked about what God's forgiveness looks like. He doesn't hold it to our account, right? Boy, I'm thankful for that because, man, my account would be very, very long. Guess what? Your account would be very, very long. And when God forgives us, he doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't hold it to our account. Oh, that we would forgive that exact way. In God's word, we find accomplished truth. We, we see in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, and scientists, they've been wrangling with this one for years and years and years, and guess what? <laughs> the answer's right here in God's word. They should have started there. Uh, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You know what? Rain is a great thing, isn't it? I don't know about you all. I just loved the rain this week. I, I, I really enjoyed that. My garden loved it. I mean, I look out at the garden now and I'm going, hey, yeah, this is looking pretty nice now. And I remember it rained and it rained. <laughs> Sorry, kids, but I enjoyed the rain this week, okay? I, I, I just did. The firewood didn't like the rain. My garden loved the rain. Um, rain. Rain is important. Rain keeps us alive. It ultimately provides sustenance for us, doesn't it? Um, we did not plant broccoli in our garden. But we have green beans, and that's green, so that's good enough, right? Okay. Um, the rain is important. That, that is God providing sustenance and nourishment for us. Isaiah says this, you know what? As great as the rain is, as wonderful as that is, God's word gives an even better promise of return. God's word says, uh, my word shall, my word uh, be that goes out from my mouth and shall not return to me empty. Why is it so important that we share the good news of Jesus Christ? You know what? It's not just words that come out, but God works through those words. And guess what? It's not going to return empty. I think it's the King James Version. I, I love the word it uses. It's not going to return void. Okay? There is a purpose for it. And so as, as we're watering our garden, you know, this summer, um, every so often I just walk out there. And uh, what do I know about gardens? Uh, Karen says, uh, dump the dirt here and turn the sprinkler on. That's about all I know, okay? And so uh, I do as I'm told because, well, <laughs> that's just a good thing to do. And, and so I remember Karen, would, Karen planted the beans. And, and I mean, she had it done just like that. I figured this was a long drawn out thing. Apparently it's not. And um, she, she had it all done. She comes in the house and she goes, wow, um, beans are all planted. We're all good to go. You know what, an hour later, I just wanted to run out there and see if we had anything. It takes longer than an hour, doesn't it? Okay. Does it take longer than a day? Yes. Well, I don't have magic beans. Mine take longer than a day. Okay. And pretty soon, Tara noticed, hey, uh, I think we got climbing beans, so we got to have something for them to climb on. So we went out there, and we got something all rigged up, and we got these vines, these beans growing up the stuff. 
And I'd run out there and I'd say, we don't have any green beans yet. And Tara would say, well, they got to blossom first. Uh, apparently, you get those flowers, right? Those, yeah, okay. And uh, so I ran out there yesterday, and, or two days ago, and I said, hey, we got, we got some flowers there. I, probably pretty close. I went out this morning, and I came back in, and I said, we got even more. Okay. The importance of rain. When we talk about God's word, God's word, as it goes out, there's always going to be a return. One of the returns is going to be this, is that that message is going to land in fertile soil. And we're going we're gonna to have people that come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be because you shared the very word of God. You know what? That's, that is just, that's enough to make you shout. Can I say that? We have that message. The message isn't going to return void. Here's what else we know. We know that one of the other benefits of that, of course, is it's not going to return to us empty. Uh, here's another reason why. Uh, because we're commanded to share that message, aren't we? We're commanded to do that. When we are obedient to Jesus Christ, that never returns empty. See, that's one of the benefits of walking with God. Of enjoying and delighting in his works. We find absolute delight in the works of God. It says in verses 12 and 13, it says this, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Great words. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The picture here is of a pure delight in the works of Creator God. That is a great song, isn't it? And I heard somebody mention that. Hey, that song, this is where it came from. The picture here is of a pure delight in the works of our creator. Do you delight in the things of God? Do you ever take time just to kind of kick back and relax and just to praise God for what he has made just for you? The other morning, it's 3.30 in the morning, um, couldn't sleep, decided to make a cup of coffee, went out to the patio. And uh, so I'm, I'm sitting out there on the patio, and, and it's dark out, and, and uh, the sounds that were around me, even the birds, they weren't quite up and around yet. And I remember looking up at the stars and just thanking God for a tapestry that Hollywood couldn't paint. I remember just being overwhelmed as I looked out and I could see the silhouettes of homes, God providing for people, right? I could look out and I could, I could see our, our little garden, just our little patch of goodness right there. Couldn't see if there were any flowers then. It was dark. But looking at that and just praising God for his provision. You know what? I had a great time of praise at 3.30 in the morning with a cup of coffee. Delight yourself in the things of God. Do you find joy in your walk with God? Is it something that is very real for you? Isaiah chapter 55 is a great place to start. We're told four times, verse 1, simply to do this, to come. Now, next week, we're going to have a Gideon speaker. The week after that, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 58. Okay? The God who is holy, the God who is awesome, the God who is sovereign, the God who invites us to come. We're going to see in Isaiah 58, we get to worship that very God. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about our identity in God. And uh, a great chapter uh, that we're going to look at there as well, okay? Uh, so I encourage you, uh, read Isaiah chapter 58. Be very thankful that we can take delight in the works of God. And this God that we've been talking about the last month in the book of Isaiah 
is the God that we worship today. He is the God that loves you today. He is the God that provides for you today. Take delight and joy in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come before you. Father, may our delight not be found in things, but Lord, may our delight be found in you. Father, the, the giver and the provider of all things. Father, may we look at our walk in a different way. May we be thankful for the forgiveness that we have. Lord, because I have been forgiven, may I be quick to forgive. May I be quick to receive, Father, and, and to give. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much. Father, your desire is that we would be walking with you. And Father, not just, not just walking, but finishing well. Father, in our walk, may we do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.